Today's head-on is Fair Oaks. The subheadline says, Charge of the Second New York Excelsior. This article was written to the editor of the National Tribune. It says, Greeley, in his American conflict and speaking of the Fair Oaks, Virginia fight, May 31st and June 1st, 1862, says that on Sunday morning, June 1st, there was nothing but a spattering fire at different places along the lines and nothing accomplished by either side. Other historians are guilty of the same mistake. Therefore, I write you. The 2nd Brigade, 2nd Division, 3rd Corps, was at the time of which I write, and in fact till the 3rd Corps was broken up in 1864, composed of the five Excelsior regiments, and was called the Sickles Excelsior Brigade. They were numbered the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th Excelsiors. They were the 70th, 71st, 72nd, 73rd, and 74th New York. But in September, the 120th New York joined the brigade. General Daniel E. Sickles was the brigade commander until he was promoted to command the 2nd Division and later the 3rd Corps. The writer commanded a Springfield rifled musket as private and Company K of the 2nd Excelsior. We crossed the Chickahominy in May 1862 and camped on the Richmond side in the vicinity of Bottoms Bridge. On Saturday, the last day of May, we could hear heavy artillery firing towards Richmond and your humble servant put on a clean shirt in order to present a spruce appearance should we call on the Johnnies, and it stayed there until some time in September, except at short intervals, when it would be taken off, turned inside out with care, and again donned with all live tenants left out to face the world and all enemies till they could again take up quarters on the other side. I think it was about 2 o'clock p.m. when we started toward the front. I had been on the sick list, and the march was very fatiguing to me, but it was the last time I was on the sick list for a couple of years. The marching was bad, and mud sometimes nearly knee-deep. Toward night, we began to meet the wounded who were being brought to the rear. Among others, I remember Colonel Van Wick, the commander of the 10th Legion. Two men were leading him. He was wounded in the head. I think it was growing dark when we reached the battlefield, and the battle had ceased for the day. We were on a ridge in open fields, just north of or to the right of the road known as the Richmond and Williamsburg Pike. There we rested for the night. At daybreak Sunday morning, June 1st, the picket firing commenced just below us at the foot of the ridge on which we were and at the edge of the woods. We at once fell in and moved southward toward the pike which we crossed. As my company was climbing the fence, our first lieutenant was mortally wounded. We now moved down towards the woods but parallel with the pike a short distance and then came right by files in the line along the south fence of the road. We were square across their right flank and they soon broke and ran out of the woods towards Richmond. While all this was going on, another body of rebels said to be a division advanced through the slashing and woods south of the pike and had we remained much longer in the position we then occupied, we would have been caught on our left flank as we had just caught the enemy on the right flank. As soon as the enemy were discovered, a skirmish line was thrown out to face them and the regiment moved by the left flank and column of fours file left till we had got the proper distance when we right flanked thus bringing us in line of battle again. And as our skirmishers came running in, we received the order to charge. By this time, the rebels were in pretty heavy force at the edge of the woods. We received the praise from the commander of the army of making the finest charge of modern times. However that may be, the enemy broke and fled before we could close with them. Whether they became panic-stricken or their officers caused their hasty retreat, I don't know, but in either case, the fact remains that they were afraid to meet us with the bayonet. We were not permitted to pursue them as we were very desirous of doing. The enemy retreated out of the wood and across the open space, where there was a good line of breastworks behind which they could have easily rallied and made a good fight if they had chosen to do so. But they ran right on and plunged into the woods beyond. My impression was then that if we had been commanded by an able, energetic man, we would have run them into Richmond on one side and out at the other side. I have never had any reason to change my opinion of the matter. Amongst the trophies of the charge was a coach and four, which had come down from Richmond with a gang of young sprigs of FFVs to see us driven into the Chickahominy, but as the driving was the other way, they got taken in for we captured them. An old small house stood partially to the right and rear of us as we charged. Some rebel sharpshooters were stationed in the house. They began firing at our officers. I think General Sickles was their principal target, but he was not hit. He gave orders to capture them, and I think there were five or six of them. I feel positive if we had hesitated or wavered, it would have encouraged the rebels, and the result would have been a severe and prolonged battle without any decisive results. Our quick positive movement seemed to demoralize them and saved us from severe loss. 
what the upper regiments of the brigade were doing. I don't know. I only speak for the glorious old 2nd Excelsior. The men of upper commands know what part they took in the battle and can tell it much better than I can, and to them I leave the task. I understand it was the order to charge that day all along the line, and I believe in each case the enemy refused to stand bayonet charges. This article was written by Morris Edwards of Company K, 2nd Regiment, Excelsior Brigade of Saugerties, New York. This story comes from the Great District of Columbia, being reported in the National Tribune of December 27, 1888. Thank you for joining us today. If you want to continue to uncover all of America's lost and forgotten history, then remember before you leave to hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and remember to like and comment below. And we will see you next time on Americana Archives.